Hi, I'm Jerry Markle. I'm an educational psychologist and principal of Managing Your Mind Coaching and Seminars here in Ann Arbor. And today's presentation is study strategies for test taking. And test taking is really a pretty critical aspect of any student's life. But unfortunately, we don't teach it in a very systematic way. And many students are just getting uh, the information spontaneously or picking up strategies. So today, we're looking at test taking, looking at what you would do to prepare, what you do during a test, and what you do after a test, looking at effective strategies to help you achieve the kind of grades you want. And we're going to provide some checklists, some aids, some strategies uh, to help with that process. And so test taking is a process, a systematic set of strategies that you use to get the goals that you want. And more specifically, you want to look at test taking and test preparation as a way to get command over the content. The specific course you're taking is going to be used not only to pass the test or contribute to your major or your minor or just credits, but it's going to be integrated with other knowledge. So we want to look at test taking in a broader sense that helps you gain command of the information. So if you're just studying before a test and forgetting it, studying before another test and forgetting it, you don't get the kind of command you might want so that you're able to use the information and access it at will. Another thing that we want to think of in taking tests and preparing for tests is that you want to look at it and as in a training situation so that you get a peak performance. That means understanding your strengths and weakness in a particular course or how it relates to test taking, to understand what the task of this test is. Is it primarily to apply information? Is it a, a primarily to show somebody that you've memorized formulas? And the other thing is to create your best settings so that you can study effectively and, if necessary, organize the test taking situation so that you can have less distractions and more attention. We want you to have good test taking so that you accumulate the kinds of grades that you can get on your transcript, of course, contribute to your GPA. But in addition, you want to get a feeling of satisfaction when you finish the test, not of increased stress and regret. And so part of what we're thinking about is looking at yourself. The first step in enhancing any set of strategies is to do a self-check. And you can do it by yourself. You can do it with a friend. You can do it with an advisor. You can do it with a, uh, an instructor of the class. And when you look at these kinds of questions, you want to think, how do these questions relate to each particular course? Because it may be different. You may be a whiz in one kind of course using multiple choice, but not be very good in another course. And so do you freeze? Are you worried before the test and get a slow start? What do you do in terms of problem solving? Can you solve the kinds of problems or situations or case studies that are required for you to get a good a grade on a test or a presentation or a project? Uh, another thing is, do you take practice tests? And do you create practice problems? So if you're reviewing your notes, it may be that for every set of notes, you create either an essay question or a couple of multiple choice questions. And if in case there aren't practice exams for your course, you and your classmates can develop a kind of test uh, for you to take. If there is a particularly difficult course or a cumbersome course where there are lots of things to keep track of, it may be that you use a checklist like this to think about all the different requirements of the course. This helps you stay on track. And when this happens, if whether you're using a checklist like this or just using your syllabus to check off that you've done the assignments and the reading, when you do that and you uh, learn as you go, then when you get to preparing for a test, you're really reviewing. But too frequently, people don't look at their notes, read something, and forget about it. And it's not until just before the test that they begin to, quote, review. 
but really they're not reviewing. They don't know the information and they really have to spend time learning it. When we talk about learning, um, it's important to remember the levels of learning because tests, projects, um, presentations may rely on one level more than another. So if you're in a very basic course, it's perhaps a science course, math course, where you have to learn terms, definitions, formulas, you'd be on this lower level of learning and you're really trying to memorize and maybe go to the next level, be able to explain a formula, a definition, a concept. Uh, and this is useful to look at if you're doing lots of problem sets, you want to look at that problem and say, what concept or what definition, what relationship is being used, and can I talk about it and explain it? The next level has to do with application and problem solving. And very frequently, when people are learning things, even when they're doing problem sets, they sort of don't ensure they're learning by reviewing the problem set or by doing a test of their homework assignment under time conditions, not using the cues and clues. So we want to make sure that when you get into a test, if you're looking for a peak performance, you can perform on demand with no cues and clues, under time pressures, and with great speed and accuracy. And as with any elite athlete or performer, you need to be practicing first untimed and then timed conditions so that you really are ready for a good performance when you get into um, your exam. At the higher levels of learning, then you might be saying, can I analyze this situation? Can I integrate some materials? So if I have an essay question that requires me to look at you know, four centuries of literature or dig down deep in a deep analysis, that I've practiced doing that. And so you want to look at the syllabus and say, what levels of learning are required by the description of the course in the syllabus or by the assignments. And when you start doing that kind of analysis, you get um, a deeper level of understanding of what the course is about and what the final exam or mid-semesters might be. The first kind of uh, thing you do after you evaluate yourself is to look at how can I start to improve my test scores. And the first step in that is to look at results of your past tests. That gives you a key. It gives you an opportunity to talk to an instructor. You want to look at what kinds of problems do I do best? What take me the longest? Where is the most confusion? Am I missing details? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And where there are vulnerabilities or weaknesses, can I spend twice as much time practicing that essay question, the organization of the essay question, um, than I have to memorize some of the definitions. And um, it's often the case that an instructor, especially early in the term, is able and willing to explain to you the nuances of a test. Where did the information come from? In this particular question that you uh, didn't get, was the information in a reading? Was it a supplemental reading? Was it a text? Was it your notes? Um, was it something that was discussed but perhaps not on a slide? So finding out where the information is uh, is critical in getting you to be aware and then set up a study schedule that helps you get to those uh, places. Then uh, one of the things you want to do is make a plan. That's the next step. Identify a small goal. Is it that you're pretty good at the beginning, but you sort of get tired at the end of the test? Is it that you forgot to look at the points of the test? So in one student's paper I saw, it was a very difficult test, and there were problems throughout the test worth you know, 15 points, but the beginning was much more difficult. The instructor decided to give them a break at the end. And so one of the easiest problems for the 15 points was at the end. And because the student didn't look the, over the test, they left that problem out. They definitely would have gotten those 15 points. So the traditional study strategies 
include understanding where you failed on a previous test and what you could do. You may be, have an excellent history in math or science or reading or writing, and then you get into a particular course where it's really difficult. And it's important to look at the kinds of questions you got, right or wrong, and decide, do I need a tutor? If you need a tutor, you need a study group, you need to go someplace like the Sweetland Center, um, you need to go to you know, the study hours of the G GSI, you need to start planning earlier. Don't think that smarts carry you through in a course where perhaps you don't have enough prerequisite skills or all of a sudden the material is coming at such a fast rate uh, that you can't keep up. It may be also that your reading skills are not on a par with the difficulty that you, of the materials that you have to read. And so it may be that you want to work with your instructors to see what do I read first, how do I read it, am I reading mainly for main ideas, uh, how is this related to other materials that I'm reading. And another uh, thing that helps you is to decide where are your best study places. So it may be that you realize that studying in a coffee shop or a busy library is not the best for a particular course and make those changes early. And when we're talking about places to study, one of the things that helps students is to find that place where they're comfortable, where they're quiet, where they can be relaxed, where they can really focus. You may be a person that's very sensitive to a particular kind of lighting or particular types of noises. You may be able to ignore some noises, but be very sensitive uh, to other noises. So maybe soft voices don't bother you, but the beeping of a fluorescent light might. Uh, another thing is to find that place where you don't know a lot of people, if it's something that you really have to focus on, and institute a kind of friendly schedule. Many students report that they go to the library and they want to study for three or four hours at a time. Your course may require that much study, but the research tells us that four hours at one time is not the most effective schedule. So dividing study into short, doable amounts, maybe 20 to 30 minutes, maybe one problem, and then taking a short break. And a short break uh, include stretching, breathing, um, maybe looking at cartoons, anything that sort of relaxes you and gets you to refocus and regenerate your attention. Many students also report that when stuck, they may sit and spin their wheels and ruminate, I should know this, I don't know why I don't know this, and keep trying when they just are not going to find the answer or understand a particular concept. In those cases, you want to make sure that you know when office hours are and pre-plan going. You may not go, but at least put at least one office hour uh, on a schedule for every week. So you take your four courses, perhaps just to check in. You have uh, the, first month, the first week of the month, you go to one course and then you rotate uh, so that eventually you're seeing at least, you're seeing an instructor at least once a month. I talk about an electronic lockdown. Some people look like they have phones growing out of their ears and it's really important to turn all the devices off. If you must use a computer, then you have to promise or be with somebody that disallows, you know, surfing on the internet. So for 15, 20 minutes, you turn every device off, the television, the phone, um, the internet, and see if you can just focus, really relax, quiet down, stop everything from feeling like you have an overload, and focus on that problem, and be able to talk to yourself, and listen to yourself, and draw, and do the kinds of active learning um, that are required for really memorizing, retaining, and then integrating all the knowledge that you have. Uh, smart people can do a lot in a short amount of time if they know what to do and if they have their attention in full gear. There may be multiple ways and multiple places that you feel comfortable studying. For some people, 
uh, they're best with a study partner because in their learning style, they're best when they talk something out. Other people really have to have, you know, their earbuds on or cut out all the sound. Other people are fine in a coffee shop, but maybe only for a course that's in an area of their strength. So you may di have different places for different courses. SQ4R is a study method that we've talked about for use in reading. It can be used for note taking. I like to use this framework because it can be used for note taking, reading, test taking, and so on. You learn one set of skills and then you apply them to the different study tasks that you have to do. So in our situation, when we're talking about preparing for tests, you survey. Well, what would you survey? You survey the test assignment, the description of the test. You survey the homework problems. Do the homework problems reflect what's going to be on the test? Or are there going to be other types of tasks on the test? What are the lecture notes? Are there any old tests that are available? What's going on in any books or supplemental reading? Do I have illustrations, aids, uh, chapter summaries? So that provides an overview of the material that would be covered on the test. The second part is questioning. Whenever you raise a question, you alert, you become more alert. Perhaps you access information that you already have. Your curiosity is piqued. Um, and so what you want to do is look for any questions that have been raised in the lecture. Any questions that are at the back of the book. Any questions uh, that have been used for quizzes. And so these questions form the bulk of the targets for your study. And for many students, um, although they may be shy or think that an instructor uh, would not be open, it's an important thing to ask for at least one sample question. You're not asking for the whole test, but one sample question. If an instructor doesn't have a question, perhaps you want to make up some questions, either from one lecture or three lectures, see what is related to one, you know, an essay question that ties together three topics from your uh, slides or lecture, and ask the instructor if that's an appropriate question to prepare for. Your questions then guide your reading and your studying, and it may be that you have to select some portions to reread rather than trying to read everything at one time. Uh, and that's a place, if you're a slow reader, uh, I know several students who hire readers during the semester because they're such slow readers, they want somebody really to uh, give them the information. Other people use books on tape. And one aspect of learning is being able to visualize the material, doodle, draw a picture of it, Whatever you can do in your mind without cues and clues helps you when you get to the test. And so to continue that, once you are answering a question, you recite it in your own words. So if you're doing an economics problem, if you're doing uh, any other science problem, you do the problem. And then after you do the problem, you recite what is the main concept, how did you get there, so that you're sort of giving yourself some self-instruction, some review, and you can then replicate that when you get on a test. The next thing would be to use some kind of writing while you're reflecting. So it may be that you use a whiteboard. You can use um, just blank pieces of paper. You want to write anything that you memorized afterward so that you can write it down without looking at cues and clues. One part of study strategy is after you would do some homework problems, take those problems, perhaps a day after you've done the assignment, and see if you can do those problems without referring to the text, to the text or your notes. That gives you, one, a review, it helps you retain the information, and it helps you pinpoint places where you might not uh, remember the information. And so what you're doing is you're trying to learn as an onion from the inside out. You learn some basics, more, more, more. And so it may be that you're interacting with this piece of paper that you write something, refer to a slide or a lecture, remember it, think about it, write it down again from memory, and then do it a little bit afterward. And lastly, 
uh, we're just talking about reviewing and editing, you're constantly going back and modifying. So it may be that after three or four lectures, you want to set something up in a chart or uh, see if, how well you remember it. I call this the blank page exercise because what you could do is you try to memorize something, take a blank piece of paper, write everything down that you can remember. If you're looking at a lecture and you're trying to review it, what you might do is say, okay, here's the topic of the lecture, here's a blank page, how much of the lecture do I remember? And then go back and look and compare what you wrote with what you remembered. Because frequently when you just try and reread and reread, you sort of, your eyes are moving down the page, but your brain is sort of not absorbing the information. Another thing you can do is begin to classify, categorize, get a bigger picture of what you're doing. And so if you take this blank piece of paper, can you look at the kinds of relationships there are? Can you write summaries? And can you identify um, and do some visualization or make some charts? We'll talk, we'll show some ch charts at the end. Okay, so you're coming into an objective test and uh, you know, maybe you wanna shake yourself out, maybe you wanna stretch, maybe you wanna just relax for a minute and talk to yourself and tell, you, tell yourself that yes, I have studied. If you haven't studied, then you say, well, this is a test, you know, it'll show me that I have to study. At least think of one good thing about yourself, one strength to keep you in sort of a positive mode. Specifically, warming up while you're taking that test, it may be that there are some formulas, you might just write them in the corner of the test so that when you have to go use that formula in a question, it's already written and you've carefully looked at the details. You wanna circle all the words, you wanna look for those always and buts and either or kinds of questions. Um, look as we said before, at the entire test to see what the point system is. And uh, it may be that if you're a little stressed before, you start with the easiest questions and go then to the beginning of the test. Once you have the test, usually you are in control of the sequence in which you do the test. And so it's very important to survey that whole test, identify what you feel comfortable with, what questions, how many points, and where you want to start. Just doing that usually gives you a greater sense of control. And let's face it, you may not have control of all of the material, but you do have control of yourself during the task. And the more control and pre-planning you have about how you're going to attack the test, the better it is. During the test, you want to see what it is that you need to do. You've got to pace yourself. So it may be that if you have a watch that vibrates, um, you have it go off every 20 minutes just so you make sure. You want to make sure that you, if you don't understand a question, you say, what concept is this question dealing with? What is the rule? What is the formula? What is the idea? And be able to go back and say, OK, if here's the formula, what is the same? If a question is written, in a negative way, then you turn everything into the positive and then go back because it's very easy to lose your attention. And when they want to say everything but, you turn it around and answer it in a different way. Uh, it may be that you've just got to take some breaks if tests are very detailed and tedious and they're on multiple pages. Put a check mark at the bottom of each page just to remind you that before you turn that page, you just relax, give yourself just a 30 second break. But if your attention is going up and down, you may be just losing it, but not really realizing that you're losing it until you really make several mistakes in a row. Charts are very useful, and it may be if you're going to be writing essay questions or you have some compare and contrast questions or complicated multiple choice questions, perhaps you just want to do an information dump in the front of the blue book. Use any kind of chart or visual and just say what the main ideas are, the dates, and so on and so forth, so then, again, you can refer back. Charts, like 
these can be used while you're studying, while you're reviewing, and during a test. So again, if you have material then you tend to get confused or worried or tired. It may be that you want to sketch out a visual, the parts of something, the relationships of something, the pros and the cons. Put all that down. It's your notes. Put it on the back of the page, wherever. And that allows you, again, to take a moment to focus, to remember, to reflect. So using, using the test questions is important. But if you're just trying to do this, go down, go down, get, got to get finished, got it. Then what happens is you're so, so consumed with getting through the test that you fail to notice some of the important aspects of the test. While some people are great at short answer or multiple choice, other people excel or don't excel uh, with essay tests. And again, planning, calming down, and organizing is the critical thing. Just imagine that there are 40 people in the class and somebody has to be reading those, maybe at 2 o'clock in the morning. So your organization of an essay question can contribute quite a bit to your points. So read the question aloud, perhaps again circling some critical aspects. What are the key terms? Do you have to list something? Do you have to compare? Do you have to trace a sequence? Um, what are the relationships and the key terms? Um, how many points? And then can I make a chart just to organize my thinking? Once that chart is made, I can introduce each paragraph with a main idea sentence. I can include an example. I can include a detail. Uh, some people are great at outlining. Other people aren't. Uh, one way of organizing an essay um, if you were in the humanities or history or whatever, you might use the word Persia. P stands for political, E stands for economic, R stands for religious, S social, I industrial, and A the arts. You may not use all of them, but you might in describing a historical period or some dr dramatical play or event, you might just be able to start each paragraph by saying politically, the context was so-and-so, economically, so that the person reading your essay is so grateful for you, uh, and you can see that you can organize it in such a way. All right, once you've got that, you might want to look at how much time is allotted to each part of that essay question. Identify short questions that you have to answer. What is the main idea question? Are there sub-questions? And so then you just outline those and then introduce each paragraph. If you can, insert headings. That might be useful. And the most important part is that you either print or write legibly. Uh, many schools are not even teaching handwriting because we're so dependent on typing in the computer. But truly, if somebody can't read what you wrote, even though it's brilliant, you're not going to get the points that you need. And if you have an outline or you draw a picture, um, draw a diagram, or you have a chart, then check off as you go. So we're really talking about a step-by-step -step strategy. We're not talking about read the question, OK, I better write the answer. I don't have enough time. If you're organized, you're better off writing well, writing legibly, and writing specifically. Um, after answering, you want to leave at least two minutes to go back, make sure that you've got the opening line of each sentence, see if you want to add a date, take a deep breath, pat yourself on the back, and you're out. Here's a format that can be used for writing papers or for outlining. You always have to have for an essay some introduction or thesis statement. You're going to have to have a conclusion. Suppose it's a complicated question you have, may have three subparts. Just visualize or even indicate on your blue book how much space and how much time you are allotting for each aspect of the question. And just sometimes having this small structure gives you, again, more confidence and that you're really able to move ahead. Test-related stress. 
One thing that creates stress is when you don't know that you have automatic knowledge, when you haven't really memorized something as well as it could be. And for people who have trouble with spelling or learning formulas, uh, one of the things that reduces stress is what we call overlearning or learning over trial periods and often learning uh, with a modality that you might not ordinarily use. One thing you can do is take a piece of sandpaper or use a rug. And if you're spelling or using um, a difficult word or formula, you might trace it on a piece of sandpaper because you're getting some kind of a tactile kind of response. You're really focusing on it as you're writing this word. You then close your eyes and see if you can write it in the air. You then would write it on a blank piece of paper and then compare it to a model. This is uh, an, an old strategy used by a woman, a woman called Fernald for uh, learning spelling words, but it really works for languages, uh, formulas, and anything that's very detailed where you want to make sure. Then after an hour, after a day, you go and you see if you still remember it. More and more people and students are talking about stress. For some people, the stress is just the tip of the iceberg, OK? Because their test stress is just reflecting uh, a lot of stress or angst uh, that they're not talking about. But for most people, there's just some normal uh, apprehension on, on being tested and performing. Uh, for other people, you know, you've grown up not taking standardized tests. You perhaps uh, you're not used to tests which require application rather than just memory. Uh, perhaps you're tired, you've been partying too many uh, hours. You never really developed study skills, you know? You got through high school or you got through even a couple of years. You just could read and learn and then all of a sudden you get on a test and you, ah, I read, I read the assignment, I sort of went over the notes. I don't, I don't, oh, oh. They really wanted it that detailed. Hmm? Oh, I really had to know the difference between this and that. So it's always important then to be reviewing what the tests are about. Um, you, you may have gotten burned on one kind of test and you have some bad memories. So regardless of the cause of the stress, students need to identify how stressed they are. And sometimes um, when I'm working with somebody, I'll say, well, how stressed are you on a, on a you know, on a range of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest. If somebody says 16, then we have to, you know, it's time to go to CAPS and look at stress management strategies or talk to a um, residence hall advisor or somebody about that kind of stress. What can you do to control and manage stress? One, learn some stress management strategies prior to test taking, whether you're using exercise, um, sleep certainly makes you way more vulnerable to stress um, and learning yoga and meditation, whatever it is, everybody in these stressful times needs a way that they can just de-escalate and, and relax. So one thing is just having those kinds of things built into a normal schedule. Um, being prepared. There's nothing as stressful as running out. I don't have my pet. Where's the, where's the, I don't have the blue, I didn't buy the blue books ahead, okay? Organize your materials, have packets. Um, don't talk to people that, you know, sort of are worry warts and, did you do that? You did it? Oh, it's definitely gonna be on the I spent an hour doing that, okay? You wanna avoid those people. Uh, you wanna rehearse visually and remember that you did study and you are organized. Frequently, uh, there was recently a test with students taking the ACT or the SAT, and what they had students do is just take a piece of paper and write all the things they were worried about prior to taking the test and said, okay, I'm not gonna worry about this now. It's all on the paper, I can worry about it. And those students who did that did a little better on the test. So sometimes getting uh, your worries out of your head and onto a piece of paper allows you just to relax for a little while. Uh, and then get into a positive uh, framework, looking at when you did study, how you did study, and then, of course, preparing your body by taking some deep breaths, you know, just that up and down kind of movement, deep breaths, thinking of something positive, perhaps stretching, and then uh, focusing on what it is that you want to do. If 
During the test, you become fatigued, you become worried. You need to take a break. This is not the time to just go through it. So you take a break, and maybe only for 30 seconds or a minute, but you have to evoke a positive image of yourself being productive. You've got to say, you know, you've done your work, now take a little rest, go on to the next problem, uh, rehearse what you're going to do, talk to yourself. When I did this problem for homework, I did it in three steps. I looked at the details. You know, in, in some of the uh, difficult tests where you have to perhaps write graphs or draw graphs, you may be very tense. You may be doing them too quickly. You may not be doing them clearly enough so that when you go back and use that graph to solve the problem, uh, you're not getting accurate information. So by taking breaks during the test and calming down and talking to yourself, you can do a lot to help yourself. Uh, for some people, they like chewing gum or having a, um, some kind of a healthy bar. Just make sure that you don't disturb other people. So here we're thinking about some summaries, some do's and don'ts. You want to prepare early for your test. You want to make sure that you have all the materials that you need. Uh, join a study group. If you join a study group, make sure that the study group is doing practice questions, that everybody perhaps makes up some questions when they come into the group. Keep your group on target. Uh, go to office hours regularly and uh, make uh, an attempt to get a tutor or talk to the instructor. Um, don't get into A-itis, the unrealistic goal that I used to get A's, therefore I must get A's on every test. Set a realistic goal with the idea of working yourself up. If you're taking a course in which you have no background, perhaps is a weed out course, is very difficult for you, this idea that you must get an A usually is debilitating. So start with learning the core material that you need for the C. Get through everything you have to. Once you have the confidence that you at least know enough for a C, you will then be able to add and add until you have um, a better grade. The last thing is always reviewing the test. If you're in the midst of preparing for mid-semesters or finals, you might identify one course and say what the goal is. I want to get three, three points more. I want to get five points more. I want to do these kinds of problems. What is the target? What, is, what strategy am I going to you, use? For most people, having an electric lockdown coupled with the blank page exercise seems to provide the best ammunition for getting attention for getting retention and being able to integrate information that you need when you take a difficult test. And then lastly, what are your study conditions? Where are you going to be and who are you going to be with and what time of day is best for you to study? So I hope these provided some good study tips for you about test taking. I have a book of study tips, a tip a day gets you an A. It's 365 study tips and quotes. And it's my gift. There's a free download for iPhone at this time. Uh, so just look under study tips and you can download it. And it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much.